Okay, welcome to Indonesian history from 1870 on. Now, before we get going, I just want to give you a brief, brief background as to where we're up to now. Um, so we're looking at, this is the larger picture is Asian history. So Asia typically starts in um, Constantinople, uh, Istanbul, that's where the Orange Express ran. So I say this, this area is uh, West Asia, then we have Central Asia around here, South Asia around India, East Asia around China and uh, Japan, Korea, and Southeast Asia is from Burma down to uh, the island of Papua New Guinea. So we're looking at Southeast Asia in general and specifically on the archipelago of Indonesia, which runs from up here in Aceh all the way through here over to one half of the island of Papua New Guinea. Now, as you know, just to give you a brief background, um, we, we discussed first the Austro-Milanesian migration, which occurred at, say, 60,000 BC up to zero. This is um, created by, if you like, the land bridge. Um, people exploited uh, low water levels in order to uh, cross all the way through to Australia and even Tasmania, right down to the south of Australia, down, right down to here, now separate. At the same time, um, they brought hunter-gathering and uh, also um, Sweden cultivation later. Um, later, very comparatively recently, about 2000, 3000 BC, around right about then, we had the Austronesian migration heading from um, Taiwan down through out Southeast Asia and eventually, as we know, um, ending up in the Pacific and in Madagascar. Um, and that's the precursor to the development of agriculture with animal husbandry and canals and so on, and also the Sino-Indian trade, which goes from China to India. This brings Hindu, Hinduism and Buddhism in particular to Indonesia and the first civilizations and the first states. So for the first time, from about the year zero, we're getting writing, we're getting intensive agriculture, we have states, we're having an urban uh, rural distinction, we're getting literature, we're getting actually the written word um, appears for the first time. Um, in the post-classical period, we saw the influence of um, the Middle East and then Europe. Middle East from about 1400 with the spread of Islam and trade from China to Middle East. And then with the development of colonialism, uh, colonizers coming initially from Spain and Portugal to the Spice Islands um, around this area of Indonesia. And then um, also getting uh, sandalwood to the south from, uh, from around Timor. Um, now, from about 1870, we get what you could call the High Imperial Age. Now, some historians think this is really the start of colonialism. Everything that happened before uh, 1500, it was just basically, uh, with the exception of perhaps Java, from approximately 1500 to 1870, Colonialism is basically uh, just a series of trading outposts, indirect rule that is ruling through local, uh, through the local establishment. Let's say if there's already a sultan there, you don't get rid of the sultan, you just put plonk yourself on top of the sultan in the hierarchy of things if you're a colonizer, that's how you go about doing it. So um, where we're up to now, so where was I? Sultan hierarchy of things. After 1870, there's a rapid change. Before 1870, the colonizers are actually kind of reluctant. They don't want to spread more. There are many cases where colonizers are invited by indigenous people to help them in a war with another indigenous group, and they invite the colonizers to join the join us, and the colonists say, "No, nah, we're not joining. We've spread we've spread far enough already. We can't keep up with it." But new technologies are arriving, and these are associated with the Industrial Revolution. What we're talking about specifically is technologies associated with steel, in particular steam, the steam engine, which is powering trains and steamboats for the first time. We're talking about the Suez Canal, which is built and cuts a um, significant period uh, of the journey. It used to be that travellers would have, the trade had to go to Europe around South Africa, from Asia around South Africa, 
now it can go through the Suez Canal, so it's much quicker. Um, we're getting other nastier things, if you like, like guns, which allow colonizers to round up and kill indigenous people around the world, to barbed wire fences to keep them contained. Um, guns, of course, exist prior to this, but now we're getting the new, um, more accurate and high-powered rifles associated with it, like Smith & Weston, that kind of thing. Um, to give you some sense on this, the guns prior to about 1870, you're probably better off with a bow and arrow or even a spear at times. But um, after 18, or mid 1800s, the guns are getting much, much better. Then, of course, later we'll get the machine gun and things like this. Okay, so that's um, the kind of brutal aspect of it. But uh, less brutal is with the steamships. Now, massive amounts of trade are possible. Before, it was just like tiny quantities of very expensive products like pepper or opium. Now we're getting enormous quantities of coal. Coffee is now being planted, brought from Africa, uh, sorry, brought from the Middle East and being planted, um, sorry, <laughs> brought from the Middle East and, and sorry, and uh, the Americas and being planted here. Tea is being brought from, in, from China to, to India through to Indonesia. Massive quantities of coffee, of tea, which is good, and sugar. You know, now we're growing sugar, growing sugar plantations in Indonesia, which is great because all these things are addictive products which help the workers who are fueling the Industrial Revolution in Europe to stay working. They get addicted. They wouldn't probably be all that interested in these new products, but luckily they can get addicted to coffee and tea and sugar and nice things like that. Um, and, of course, tobacco, which uh, creates a demand to match the supply. Um, and these steamships are hauling these vast quantities over to, um, over to Europe. We're getting the development now of large cities of urbanization. The development, um, we already have the printing press from much earlier, like we know in European history from about 1500, but from in the mid 1800s, printing presses are starting to become more common in Southeast Asia. As a result of that, there's a kind of a religious, another religious revolution. Now we're getting the modernization of religions. Before it was fine to um, mix in Indonesia, let's say Islam with local beliefs, or in, in, in the Philippines, for example, Catholicism with local beliefs. So you have what used to be a local god or spirit, you just put a saint day worship there and you can sort of indirectly worship the spirit and be Catholic at the same time. Similarly in Java, you have things like ritual meals, which can be Islamic, but also local at the same time. Now there's a new, now from about 1870 with the steamships going towards Europe, they can also carry plenty of pilgrims all the way to Mecca to do the pilgrimage. And these Islamic pilgrims come back to Indonesia with a, a much more modernistic and then later a kind of what they saw as a purer form of Islam. So we're getting the modernization of religion. We're getting the development of also uh, mo modern, if you like, legalistic, rational, bureaucratic states. This is the period where finally colonization really opens up Southeast Asia. All of what is now Indonesia pretty much is colonized by the Dutch. All of what is now in the Philippines is colonized uh, by the Americans after 1900. All of what is now Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, that is Indochina, is colonized by the uh, French. All of what is now Malaysia and Burma is colonized by the English. Thailand is not colonized pretty much we think partly because the rulers of Thailand are ha happy enough to colonize themselves and also because England and France need a kind of buffer between them. So Thailand is the only place that's not really colonized. The rest of, Indone the rest of Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, is divided up uh, by the European uh, powers. Um, so we'll take this history really only up to 1942, the modern period. I'm not sure where we're going to draw the line, where the modern period ends, whether there's a post-industrial, post-modern period. I'm not going to discuss that now. We'll just draw the line through the modern period of 1942, when the era of European colonization comes to an end, with Japan's incredible uh, um, victories as it spread throughout Asia. After it bombs, of course, as you know, in 1941, December bombs um, 
Hawaii and wipes out the American fleet and then subsequently um, defeats uh, all the colonial powers or forces them to uh, cooperate throughout um, Southeast Asia. So that's the picture. At the very base, we've got these new technologies of steel. We've got mass mass trade in these um, addictable pro addictive products like sugar, tea, opium, um, tobacco. Uh, we've got a new society developing. We've got urbanisation and um, sort of mass society based around the printing press. Later, we get radio, and later still, after 1942, we're going to get things like TV. But before that, we've already got radio and film throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, we're getting the modernization of religions, a more, a more rational or pure um, form of religion that is thought to be more appropriate for modernity. And these are the kinds of changes that bring us up to 1942. All right, I hope you've enjoyed my very brief history. Um, there are a few disclaimers I should make. Of course, these numbers like 1,400, 1,800, uh, absolutely, uh, what's the word? I can't think of the word. They're not accurate. It's just as a general marker, and um, this is a this is very much a general picture of history. Of course, in ten minutes, you can only get general pictures. The specifics are, are, are much more complicated, of course. But I hope this gives you a nice introduction, which can help you um, find out more of the subtleties of the history of Indonesia and possibly 